Welcome to the Latin American Perspectives Podcast. My name is Alex Scott. I am your host, and I am recording this podcast for you from my apartment in Fullerton, California. For today's episode, I met with LAP editors Kepa Artaraz and Melania Calistani to discuss their May 2021 issue of LAP, titled Vivir Bien, Buen Vivir, and Post-Neoliberal Development Paths in Latin America, Scope, Strategies, and the Realities of Implementation. Kepa Artaraz is a principal lecturer at the University of Brighton, where he teaches global social policy and politics. He is the author of Cuba and Western Intellectuals Since 1959, published in 2009, Bolivia, Refounding the Nation, published in 2012, and with Michael James Hill, Global Social Policy, published in 2016. Melania Calistani is an anthropologist and a senior lecturer at Kingston and St. George's University of London. Her publications include An Anthropological Journey into Well-Being, published in 2013, and Prayer as Transgression, The Social Relations of Prayer in Healthcare Settings, published in 2020. Kepa and Melania's special issue, co-edited with May Trueba, engages with the concept of buen vivir, or vivir bien, and how it has become a central driver in policy processes throughout Latin America since the early 2000s. Among the various topics we discussed, our conversation explores the contested meanings of buen vivir and vivir bien, the varying ways in which this concept feeds into alternative post-neoliberal ways of living, and the realities of implementation in policy contexts, critically exploring the strengths, limitations, and barriers of buen vivir. If you have any interest in Latin American and indigenous politics or the intersections of political economy and the environment, this issue is a must read. And I highly encourage you to download a copy from Latin American Perspectives or Sage Publishing. Now, let's get to the interview. Before we start, I do want to say uh, thank you, Kepa and Melania, and welcome to the Latin American Perspectives podcast. We've never had you on before, but I'm really excited about this topic. I think it's a really important and relevant topic, especially now. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the issue, can you provide our listeners with a brief overview of the issue and how it was that the issue came about? Yeah, I I can start. Um, So uh, I'm an anthropologist as a background, and I carried out research in Bolivia on uh, definitions of the good life in the city of El Alto. So I always had an interest uh, researching well-being or the good life. And uh, I also arrived in Bolivia at a time when uh, a group of Aymara intellectuals were starting to talk about uh, Vivir Bien or Suma Camaña. So by living in Bolivia and doing research there, I became very close to, to this topic. And um, I, I lived in Bolivia for, for a year to do uh, my fieldwork for uh, my PhD in anthropology. Uh, and, and I think it was a few couple of years later that um, I met uh, Kepa, who also carried out research in, in Bolivia. And actually the, the third uh, uh, editor, May, also did research in Bolivia. So the three of us are actually Bolivianists, uh, but at different times uh, have been doing research there. Um, and, and with Kepa, we, we also published uh, an article in Latin American Perspectives in 2015, which was about Suma Camaña in Bolivia, how it was included in the uh, new constitution um, after uh, the election of Evo Morales. And, um, and, and that was a sort of first uh, common work uh, where we started to have a dialogue uh, about Vivir Bien uh, in Bolivia in particular. Later on, uh, we also organized a workshop in in Brighton, where we had a sort of transnational dialogue with different participants, and some of these participants contributed to the special issue. And with May as well, we we thought it was really important to look at this topic. I mean, as we know, I mean, in the 21st century, there has been uh, an increasing uh, interest in in trying to to find uh, universal definitions of well-being in in different uh, um, sectors, in academia, but also uh, in governmental and non-governmental circles. Um, And um, and, and because also the impact of 
neoliberalism and uh, you know modern capitalism we thought it would be really interesting to have a special issue to look at this topic uh, because mm -hmm. somehow i think uh, in the last two decades i think as human beings uh, and uh, in terms of debates uh, uh, in different circles we have been trying to think about uh, definitions of well-being definition of a good life uh, definitions of happiness as well uh, and all of these uh, definitions and uh, conversations have been sort of overlapping but mainly the, the main issue that we wanted to look at is is a sort of market driven uh, development based on economic growth and uh, how that has been seen has not been uh, particularly powerful when thinking about well-being happiness of, of human beings in in different countries so the main issues um, were very much of thinking about alter alternative options of development, thinking also about uh, specific movements that have been uh, growing, like the degrowth movement. So we, we thought that this issue would be extremely important because it would uh, also uh, shed light on these ideas that have been developing in, in Latin America and would also give a possibility to think about globally how this could influence our conversations, even in terms of uh, climate change and sustainability. Also, because these concepts of buen vivir and vivir bien, they, they also have uh, like a specific link with sustainability. So the relation between human beings uh, and the environment or the Pachamama, mother earth as they call it you know in bolivia so i think that we we have really tried to see at how these discourses could be relevant in other parts of the world as well uh, by focusing on on the latin american context uh, because there have been different countries that have tried to implement concepts of when vivir or vivir bien and and other countries uh, with more neoliberal policies where this has not been possible, uh, but where the indigenous communities have tried to put this idea into the political debate. Yeah, um, can I can I come in? Uh, I mean, uh, sure. it is personally similar. I think my um, my my particular um, interest in, in in Bolivia, particular and and in, and in Vivir Bien, I also. I also have um, a Latin American politics kind of background uh, in terms of research. I've always had a particular interest in ways in which societies change, especially when they change dramatically through kind of revolutionary means. And, uh, and, and my, my doctoral work was on the on the Cuban Revolution, something I had to study through historically. Um, so, so it was very interesting for me when I found myself living in, in La Paz in, in 2008 and 2009, I was able to witness you know, firsthand um, some of the enormous transformations, the historical transformations taking place in the country. It was called in those days a kind of a revolution in democracy, a revolution in peace, and, and, and it was significantly changed. A new constitution, a new new mass movement uh, uh, in, in power, you know, significant prominence for indigenous communities and so on, and, and mass movements in the process. A real, um, if you like, platform, political platform for radical, sustained, significant uh, social change driven by, by, by social justice issues. So, so, so it was very interesting then to, to, to come into uh, contact with the idea of, of the Indian and so on, and to watch the farm what was going on in, in the country at the time. Intellectually, as an academic at, at the University of Brighton, I, I have worked in social policy. That has been my, my area, although I've always had an, an interest in, in, in particular, Latin American developments in, in the field of social policy and well-being, or the kinds of contributions that we can make, the kinds of interventions we can put together in a society to make everybody's lives a little bit better, to achieve, I don't know, an understanding of social justice um, and so it, it is it comes naturally i think to me to connect the, the, some of the events and issues and, and and things i was able to experience and live and, and witness in bolivia on the one hand with the with the intellectual work of social justice that is so associated with the concept of BBBN. now the challenges i think um uh, melania was putting it uh, a, a few minutes ago was it, it is all well and good to see Vivir Bien and to talk about what this might mean in terms of various uh, theoretical principles, perhaps, or ethical principles, 
how we live, uh, or how indigenous communities might have uh, considered living the end uh, throughout the ages. Another, another, uh, another matter <laughs> is how do we make sense of vivir bien in the modern world, and how can those principles then drive nation states effectively to? And I think in the case of Bolivia and Ecuador in particular, I think the issue reflected significantly um, the special issue that is um, in, the, in the cases of Bolivia and Ecuador, there are quite a few clues. I think about how to try to put into action, into, into policy, in policy action, uh, some of those principles to make people's lives good. Uh, so that's the challenge. I think that that I never saw responded uh, or answered. That the question I never saw answered when I, when I first came into uh, study of of uh, and, and and this is the, the the kind of if you like gap that I think our special issue was trying to fill. I think in the process we've generated more questions than answers. There's been a lot of heat. I'm not sure how much light there is. I think there is some light, but it's, it's not an easy answer. I mean, we don't have an easy answer here to say, oh, this is this is the recipe of the, 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 the series of process or, or, or steps you follow in order to uh, operationalize uh, the concept of VBN that results in meaningful change. I think that is how I, I personally came uh, into this this particular issue and, 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 and what I think we were trying to do. There's one final thing that I haven't said, which is that in many respects, I think Latin America is a, is a, is a very is a particularly interesting region in the world because it, it always seems to be at the forehead of, of, of significant and convulsive political change. And I think in the case of Ovibirbia in Latin America, I think can provide very useful lessons to the rest of the world with regards to getting into some form of uh, venturing into some kind of uncharted territory about what a post in this, you know, as the title of the special issue says, post neoliberal um, development agenda might be. And I so thought so it'd be good to get together the special issues, especially with the American uh, perspectives, which are such a, such a wide and broad uh, readership, such a global readership, and, and try to perhaps begin this conversation of, of uh, showcasing what we believe is about in Latin America, some of the pitfalls, the problems, the challenges, the, the successes perhaps, and then perhaps use that as a way of starting a, a dialogue and communication on an issue which I think is global in nature. How do we live well and how do we how do we live well within the confines of the planet is, is, is surely the biggest problem uh, that we all face in the, in the world. So, so we hope to make a tiny bit of a contribution to that debate with this special issue. Well, thank you both very much for that background. I love how both of you and your other co-author are Bolivianists and came to this through doing research through Bolivia. It's one of my favorite countries on the planet. Absolutely love it. Now, just because many of our listeners or some of our listeners, hopefully not, but it's possible, haven't heard of Living Well or Vivir Bien or Buen Vivir. So could you provide some, some more information on what that is as a movement and maybe some specific historical or uh, contextual information for the listeners on how it, how it came about, when it came about, etc.? Okay, so so what is when vivir or vivir bien? Um, this is the uh, straightforward question that nobody can answer straightforwardly, I'm afraid. Um, I think the special issue is, is no is no exception, although there are multiple definitions discussed within the uh, the special issue about this. But let me uh, at the risk of oversimplification, I think what we need to do when we talk about vivir bien or when vivir is uh, make a significant distinction, I think, between uh, the concept itself and then perhaps the politics that have made that concept come into international attention. So these are different things. And, and we should start with that. Um, when we talk about vivir bien, we talk about a common understanding or, or, or an understanding of the good life shared by multiple indigenous communities in Latin America. And I think you, you can probably find that there is a connection, I think, with uh, indigenous and, and tribal communities all around the world between their ethics and understanding of what it is to live well. And 
the reason why this is important is because he has uh, this common understanding of, of the good life of, of many indigenous groups in Latin America uh, is, is important is because he has gained enormous notoriety, I think, in the last few years for very many political reasons. So this, this is the, 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 the binary that I want to explore. Now, let's start with the concept. So the concept, I think, presents perhaps, if you like, Melania, I think, would agree with me when I say that the concept of perhaps presents a collective understanding of well-being, a, a, a sense of what it is to be well with others. And in that, I think, is, is, is quite significantly different from, from most liberal philosophy dominant in Europe and the United States. So it's a, a kind of a relational form of well-being. You cannot be well on your own. You need to be well with others as part of a community, a group, a collective. Yeah. Now, all the different understandings of, you know, living, uh, vivir bien in, in Bolivia or when vivir in, in, uh, in, uh, in Ecuador or Kume Molgen, uh, as it is discussed in the special issue in the case of, of Chile and so on, in relation to health, all of those probably uh, are expressed in different terms, but they all make emphasis on two common issues. The first one, I think, is, is the social justice distributive element of living, of vivir bien or living well. The, the, the kind of element that I think ensures that we can all live with each other in relational terms. Yeah. Um, so this is about sharing, really. It's about social justice. It's about making sure that one person doesn't have it all and, and others don't have anything. Um, I think in, in terms of the way this, this makes sense to the world, I would say that in a world where you have two billionaires right now uh, competing with each other to, to decide who is the first one to come into space, whereas at the same time you have hundreds of millions of people starving in the world, this is a just world. So I think living well in this case, uh, or vivir bien, you know, raises a finger and says, hang on a minute, this is, this is, this is not on, and, and this is wrong. So, so that's the first element, the, the social justice element. The other thing, the other important element in, in all definitions of vivir bien is the way in which the principle uh, suggests that humans not above nature. On the contrary, humans are very much part of nature and not masters of the natural world. This also goes very much against all the dominant philosophical ideas that have informed our global capitalist development in the West. So what the principle states basically is that we need to learn within the limits that nature imposes on us. When Bolivians talk about, about vivir bien, they talk about Pachamama, they say we are children of the mother nature. We cannot really live above uh, and beyond the limits imposed by that. We are, we are part of the natural world. Now, I think this is really interesting uh, in, in many respects. It's, 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 it's a form of it's a form of knowledge that is important and, and, and relevant to indigenous peoples around the world, but actually it's a type of knowledge that most of us deep down could tend to agree with, I think. Um, and, and I think it, it is particularly important because of the, of the profound implications it has for the world right now. Um, I would say that Vivir Bien is not just about how indigenous people live, it's not just about Saying, okay, well, indigenous people can, can, can live in some kind of, um, I don't know, imaginary uh, happiness uh, from the past. That's not at all what this is about. What I think is, is, is relevant about Vivir Bien is what it can tell us about how we, you know, about the lessons that, that, that make it relevant to the, to the rest of the world. I think Melania has already alluded to quite a, to quite a few of, of, of these things in her first uh, intervention and response, um, especially in relation to the questions of development capitalist development, extractive processes of development that are unsustainable and are generating all sorts of problems, including climate change. I mean, we have just gone through some of the hottest uh, days ever recorded. Well, in fact, the hottest, we've broken all sorts of all, all, all records in, in Canada, and Canada and the Northwest of the United States. So I think this is also relevant to, to citizens of the United States. We like to encourage this, this kind of dialogue and communication between some of the ideas contained in this special issue um, and some of the real uh, social problems being faced by the world right now. I think for those of you, for U.S. audiences, uh, politically aware of these U.S. audiences, I, I like to point to the fact, you know, especially to the work of somebody like Naomi Klein or, and Ocasio-Cortez and other progressives who have been proposing a Green New Deal, for example, or, um, or some levels of post-pandemic uh, equality. I'm, I'm thinking about Twitter. 
the, that did the rounds in social media a few months ago called Letters from the Future, where they read um, a letter to the to the present uh, us, uh, telling us about the way we were about the ways we were able to overcome the ravages uh, caused by the pandemic, um, socioeconomic inequality, and climate change. I think that's the um, the direct dialogue I would like to have between the Virgin, what we just talked about, and the relevance that, that it creates for, for debates and problems that we are facing right now. Okay, so I talked a little bit about the concept itself and what it means, the, the ideas of social justice and, and sustainability on the one hand. Um, in terms of the political process of BVP and of where, um, of when we read, I think it's important to um, to note how it, what I think is interesting about it is the way in which the, the concept of Ibirbien has made it to the international agenda. And I think it's very much connected with the rise of uh, indigenous movements, their politics and, and governments or indigenous movements influence on governments. Um, and that has led, I think, to the adoption of indigenous forms of knowledge. Now, this is a struggle, I think, that for me begins with the March of Indigenous People in Bolivia in the 1990s, the March for Dignity and Recognition and the protests, the celebrations, or rather the protests of the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Columbus in the Americas back in 1992, which I remember firsthand, because um, for the first time, it challenged very significantly the official history that had been taught in Spanish schools that said, you know, we were there to, on a civilizing mission. We uh, we converted savages into good, good Christians, and um, and everything we did, we did well, and uh, we should be very proud, of, um, you know, of that fact, and, and pat ourselves in the back. And uh, those those protests, I think, painted a very very different picture that, <laughs> that had already been made by uh, you know by Eduardo Galeano, although there's you know decades earlier. But for me personally, they said, oh my God, what, what is going on here? And, and it's at that time I think that you know that entire political process of indigenous relevance uh, into the politics that brings along its own forms of knowledge or an understanding of the world that I think culminates to some extent with the election of Morales in Bolivia or Rafael Correa in, in, in Ecuador and uh, and the adoption eventually of the principles of Vivir Bien into the constitutions of those two countries. Now Vivir Bien doesn't apply just to Bolivia and Ecuador. And indigenous communities are, are, you know, demanding the recognition of those principles and those forms of knowledge uh, in all sorts of areas of policy whenever they 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 relate to the state, as the special issue, you know, points out. But I think in those two countries there is something sp special about about the, the place of Ibiza in, in in the policy process in those two countries, and that's driven, I think, by the uh, by the fact that the, the, the their new constitutions, relatively new constitutions, is still. Um, both incorporate the, the principles of Ibirbien and that both countries have published developmental plans for the future, you know, five year long, 10 year long developmental plans that incorporate or try to um, bring into policy some understanding of, of Ibirbien. So I think that as a way of framing the house development process and connecting it to, to this particular case. So I think that's, I'm not sure how useful that is as an answer as uh, <laughs> what we really, really, really is, but I think that's that's what I would have to say. Yeah, and, and, and perhaps, uh, can I can I add something, uh, Alex? Please, please, yeah. please. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps, I think that was great, actually, Kepa. You gave a very good overview. Um, uh, perhaps I, I just wanted also to uh, talk about uh, um, a little bit more about the historical process because um, this is something that we also try to, to do in the special issue uh, because we, we are looking at, as Kepa was saying, at all the different forces, so the, the indigenous movement, uh, but also uh, the impact, uh, for example, of local intellectuals that have mm -hmm. on uh, on the politics of, uh, of the Virbien. Uh, and something I wanted just to make as a sort of uh, addition to, to what Kepa said, uh, is that, for example, we have Vivir Bien in Bolivia, uh, but we have Buen Vivir in Ecuador. But these were concepts that uh, started to, uh, to spread thanks to uh, local intellectuals. So we know Carlos Viteri and uh, Alberto Costa in Ecuador, uh, while in Bolivia, you know, uh, Simon Yampara and Javier Medina, they were really influential. And also there is, of course, uh, the influence of the German international cooperation, uh, GTZ, um, that has 
try to rise uh, uh, the prominence of the concept since uh, uh, 2000 with different events and also with publications across Latin America. And I remember actually when I arrived uh, in Bolivia to do research for, uh, for my PhD, I remember that publication, um, you know, uh, by GTZ with uh, prominent local intellectuals providing uh, chapters and contributions about what Summa Camagna Vivir Bien was uh, and why it was important to, uh, to look at it. And, and Cape has already given, I think, a very good overview of uh, the relation with, uh, uh, you know, nature and the relation with, um, you know, with other people. So the importance of harmonious relations with others. So the Vivir Bien is very much living well together, but there are some sort of always challenges to put that um, into practice. Uh, and similarly, the same has happened in, in Ecuador with Carlos Vitieri and uh, Alberto Costa. And their influence, I, I think, is important to, to take into consideration because uh, without them, I don't think this concept would have come to a sort of international uh, arena. And of course, uh, also, the indigenous movements had, had a really important uh, uh, influence, uh, but I think that there are different actors uh, that are involved uh, in the overall process, and we need to consider all of them. And I mean, there is actually a specific contribution in our special issue by Belling and uh, other cultures that look at the global uh, discourse of Vivir Bien and Buen Vivir. And what they mean by global is a concept that is relevant both at the local level and at the global level. So I think that here we have so many different uh, layers and levels we, we engage with. It is important to recognize uh, that in these different levels, there are different actors and, uh, and there is a continuous reconstruction uh, of the concept and, and what it means. So uh, uh, something that we have also written it's a sort of concept that is not defined yet. It's something that continues to, to evolve. It has some main sort of aspects and principles, but how different actors engage with it, I think it's quite interesting to, to see uh, at all the different levels. And going back to uh, actually to, to the contribution that Belling et al. have uh, made, so they, they talk about three dominant discourses that is important to take into consideration when looking at Buen Vivir and Vivir Bien. And one is the indigenous uh, sort of discourse, which is what Kepa has explained quite well. Then we have the neo-Marxist discourse, uh, which is very much built on the critique of modern capitalism and what is not working in our world and how inequalities have been perpetrated throughout uh, all these years. And then, of course, we have the third one, which is about the ecological post-development critique. And of course, is what Kepa was talking about, and that link with sustainability, climate change, and all the challenges that we face worldwide. Excellent. Thank you so much for that information that we're starting to paint a, a real picture here and get some understanding of what Vivir Bien is. Now, you've already started to answer this question in part, but I want to ask it more directly. You've described how this is an always changing, developing, organically changing movement, and it's changed over time over the past couple decades, and it, it hasn't been applied universally the same in any context, although there are these commonalities, especially between like Ecuador and Bolivia. But I'm very curious, what is the relationship between Buen Vivir or Vivir Bien in relation to other leftist or progressive social and political movements that were really prevalent in Latin America throughout the latter 20th century. Has Buen Vivir been influenced by these movements? Has it broken away? I'd, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. So in terms of the relationship between Buen Vivir and other progressive and left-wing movements in the, in the 20th century, Look, I, I began my, my academic career writing political history, and, and I wrote on the, uh, on the Cuban Revolution in the 1960s, the role of the intellectuals played in that process, their communication and exchange with other intellectuals, 
um, around the world, um, mostly about in, in Europe and, and in the United States, which is where those you know homegrown intellectuals, Cuban intellectuals, were looking for uh, ideas. And I think it's true to say, it's fair to say, we think about the, the two elements uh, of the conceptualization we live here, the social justice one and the sustainability one. The sustainability one. I think it's fair to say that mid 20th century left wing movements in Latin America um, have really had a, I would say, a blind spot on the sustainability environmental issue. I think social justice has been a cry of, of all left wing movements during the 20th century. Uh, they talked about you know, democracy, certainly Latin America, in, a, in an area of, of uh, multiple dictatorships and authoritarian governments. So democracy has been a rallying call. Social justice has been a rallying call for farmers, for agricultural workers, uh, peasants in the region. Land reform has been a rallying call and continues to be a rallying call. And, and it's, it's absolutely fair that it should be. But I think it is fair to say that the intellectual, uh, the, the sustainability issue has been certainly, like one look, I'm thinking about the Cuban revolution and beyond, thinking about, you know, late 50s, 60s and, and beyond. I think the sustainability issue really hasn't, hasn't been core to the messaging of many of these movements until the last 15 years. 15, 20 years. And I think that's that's an interesting point to make. The other thing I think is also fair to say that in relation to what I what I started with this answer with, which was that I I, I was doing a, a kind of a my in my academic career, I was doing a political history of the Cuban Revolution and looking at intellectuals and the role of intellectual. I think it is fair to say is those intellectuals who led, who, who theorized left wing movements, revolutionary uh, transformations in Latin America in the mid 20th century were often intellectuals who are operating within the confines of ideas generated elsewhere, very often generated in Europe, generated in the United States. I mean, in, in, in the Cuban case, it was, it was openly so. There was perhaps a, um, I don't know, this is uh, perhaps the, the result of a colonial mentality, one could use that word without being pejorative. The idea that somehow the thinking had to come from, from elsewhere. And the action happened in Latin America. That's certainly the, the, one of the main conclusions of, of, of some of my uh, doctoral work when I was doing this kind of thing. Well, I think Bivirian does, I think, is, is transform, change that completely. And I think it, it has its roots in ideas that are rooted in the social and political realities of, of, of the places where they are being applied. And I think this is one of his most, if you like, revolutionary and, and interesting aspects of this concept. I think Vivirian represents, if you like, a certain um, coming of age of, of, of new political actors in Latin America who bring to prominence ideas that make sense of their reality. So you have work, you know, you have all sorts of intellectuals now from all over the world, like the Sosa Santos, who's spoken about many different forms of knowledge and a form of cognitive justice of ideas. The fact that we can talk about Vivirbien without appropriating it away from the owners of those ideas, which I think is important to, to point. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want this issue or us to, or us to be accused of, of intellectualizing and appropriating somebody else's ideas. That's not the point. The point is to bring them to the um, them to the world, if you like. So I think it's, well, the, the issue of cognitive justice is very important. Was also the Santos has spoken about in relation to many, 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 many knowledges. And I think that's one of the most important elements of of the um, of the concept of of Vivirbien that perhaps was missing in previous uh, left wing, uh, progressive, uh, revolutionary political movements in the 20th century. Now, in relation to the different knowledges, I'm just, just going to say one final thing, which is that our issue, I think, is openly calling for the, for the uh, if you like, the dialogue between some of the main elements of Vivir Bien to be put to use to help us understand some of the biggest social and global challenges, problems, social problems that, that, that we have to face in the form of climate change, for example, or runaway you know, economic inequality. And I think it's fair to say that some of the authors in the in the issue, like Bailin uh, et al., write precisely about the difficulty for dialogue between what are very different, what they say, epistemic platforms and realities. They say, you know, there are all sorts of attempts to turn into policy ideas of the European that really uh, do not lend themselves to that, to that kind of transformation. I, I wouldn't be that pessimistic. 
but at the same time, I accept there is a significant challenge uh, in, in doing this. And I think the issue reflects this pretty well. There are a number of authors and a number of articles that uh, make an assessment of some of the policy, economic policies, for example, of the Korea government in one of them, um, and have some more or less positive analysis to make about this. They discuss the challenges, the, the successes. Others uh, don't even enter into that kind of uh, dialogue because they stand on the principle that this is not possible, if you like, it, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to, to, to transform conceptual ideas into, into specific policies that can you know, deliver an understanding of, of the Irvian that is um, accepted by all. I'm not sure Alania wants to add something to that. Yeah, perhaps, I mean, something that, I'm asked, that I was thinking about while you were talking, Kepa, is very much, um, I mean, in terms of the limitations and challenges, it's um, that, as we said before, these concepts have different meanings for the different actors uh, involved. So although, for example, they, they are influenced by left-wing uh, uh, movements, I mean, we have also to recognize and I carried out, uh, for example, research, uh, uh, ethnographic research with two communities, two Aymara communities in, uh, in El Alto, one more in the city and one more outside uh, in, in the rural area uh, of El Alto, that now has become part actually uh, of the city. But at the time when I did research, it was a, a village. And I realized that uh, even within the indigenous communities, there are differences uh, about uh, what vivir bien uh, means and um, an element for example that had an influence on on the concepts of, of vivir bien individual concepts was very much for example the religious affiliation and the place of residence uh, that changed slightly what it meant and of course at the time of my research my research participants they would use the term suma hakanya which is uh, the good life at the house level but when thinking about Suma Kamanya, which was the term the local intellectuals, Javier Medina, Simon Yamparan were using, they, they, they would know the meaning of Suma Kamanya, but they said that it was a sort of ideal that was very difficult to achieve. And I think that uh, their perspective is very important because uh, it highlights some of the issues connected with this term because of the, you know, of the different forces, the global forces that have an impact locally as well. And because uh, for them, Suma Kamanya was actually that, that idea that Kepa has talked about of justice, of uh, equality, that was very difficult to achieve because of the you know, daily uh, challenges that they had to overcome. So just to say that I think, uh, I mean, it takes us probably to, to talk about uh, um, some of the issues in terms of uh, limitations and uh, shortcomings, but also thinking again about uh, different positionalities and different experiences of, of what the concept mean as well. And, and I think that, of course, in terms of left-wing movements, I think uh, there was a real urgency to and hope that this concept could, uh, could actually lead to more equality, which in some cases I think it has, but not completely, not as the concept of Suma Kamanya that my research participants were talking about, uh, because that's something so ideal and equality for everyone uh, in society but in our world especially if, if something doesn't change it's very difficult to put it into practice so i just wanted actually to just to add this thank you for adding that i think it's, it's very important very relevant to the conversation now with all of that in mind as we as we all know especially in the early 2000s, some of these policies uh, achieved real political successes, especially in Bolivia and Ecuador. And I, I'm curious, what were some of the key challenges governments faced uh, in establishing and promoting these types of, of policies and political platforms? I'm just thinking about the challenges. I think the, 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 the obvious first issue is 
uh, accepting or implementing I mean, understanding and receive wisdom or no or understanding of what we're doing is 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 how much buy-in there is in a government towards this idea and the challenges it poses. And and I think it's fair to say you mentioned both Bolivia and Ecuador are the two countries where Vivir Bien, where Vivir has made it into the constitution. There are there is a, a series of policy documents and attempts to engage with the concept and make it a, a policy reality. The truth is that in most countries in Latin America, this is not the case. So Vivir Bien then becomes um, an aspiration, a demand, a political argument, something brought about by often indigenous communities that are making, that are trying to improve um, the lot or, or using Vivir Bien as a, as a rallying cry to make suggestions or policy recommendations or demands in relation to their uh, land, the way this is managed, their access to health care, or, or more broader social policy objectives. So the first issue, I think, is, is this buy-in between governments. Then there is a question, I think, of, of definition and understanding of what we mean by BBB. And of course, all, all governments <laughs> tend to have a... Um, they try to, I think it's fair to say, monopolize this process. So I think in this particular issue, we have an article by Van Teilingen and Fernando Salvador, for example, and they discuss the role of Ecuador Estratégico as, as one uh, a particular form of a state institution. Um, and they explain in quite a lot of detail the very determined approach to taking control of the formulation of Vivir Bien and using Vivir Bien in ways that justified the government's extractive economic policies. Uh, so, so this is this is an example of, of of one of the challenges you could have. You could have a, a in principle attempt to say, okay, yeah, yeah, we're all for Vivir Bien, but then uh, completely subvert the meaning of Vivir Bien in order to justify whatever it is you want to justify or business as usual, which is effectively what these two authors uh, seem to be arguing. Effectively, they say, you know, this is a state institution that is taking a few revenues from taxation and spending it, spending it in, in traditional social policies for the communities most effective, affected by, by those mining extractive e economic policies and activities, and then say, okay, we are, we are in the business of BBPN and this is how we are making it a reality. That, that, that hardly qualifies, I think, as a, as a genuine attempt I would say to uh, you know to implement the, the spirit of the video. However, the question of governments dominating the policy agenda in a very top-down fashion, according to predetermined understandings of the end that conveniently ignore the views of local indigenous populations, I think I'm afraid it's a common strategy. And we've also seen that being discussed in, in quite a lot of detail by Carreño and Calderon, by Picaroni Sobrado, or another two papers in this special issue who discuss the, in the respective discussions on what they call intercultural health practices and interventions in Chile. They're referring to uh, indigenous communities in Chile and also to Aymara communities in, in northern Chile as well. And this discussion is even, it even appears in another one of the papers, I think, by uh, Alderman. He is talking about, he's writing about housing policy in Bolivia and houses being built for effectively poor Bolivians, where the question of the type of housing, the size of housing, the materials with which that housing is going to be built were entirely predetermined by government actors without any consideration for the cultural uh, sensitivities of the materials. In this case, there was a discussion as to whether those houses should be built with brick or with adobe, which is a traditional expectation of the people who were supposed to be receiving those houses. And the, and the manipulative abuse, if you like, or use of those houses as as a, as a way of buying political support and so on. So all of those things are deliberate subversions, I think, I would say, of the concepts uh, and the ideas and the spirit of, and the spirit of, of the European. But I think it's the inevitable, the inevitable consequence of the policy process of politics in the tra translation of ideas and general principles into specific uh, social intervention. Then I think there is another another challenge to uh, establishing or promoting European policies, and this is especially I think in economic policy and in, in development. This is the actual difficulty of charting a course of development where there is no roadmap, and I think this is particularly 
difficult for countries like in the Latin American region where that rely so enormously on natural resource extraction. They are cutting the timber, mining those minerals, uh, you know, selling that gas and that oil with little transformation. And in that context, and serving a, a global market. It's very difficult to escape from the structures, I think, uh, on which they find themselves in development terms. And I think we found this uh, very much with the Yasuni ITT project, which is discussed by a number of the, uh, of the papers in this special issue, which failed. Um, there is no other way of, <laughs> of marking that, that piece of work that failed miserably. Um, but then we have Tipnis, the Bacol in Bolivia as well, which went very much against all kinds of principles that the, um, the Morales government was supposed to be signing up to. Um, it went against the uh, local population, against, against its own laws, its own constitution, and it was all done in the name of so-called development. Development understood in very, very mainstream traditional <laughs> terms, economic growth built on, on more extractive industries, um, which goes completely against some of the basic fundamental principles. And I think finally, if I can say this, there is an issue of ideology. I think Vivir Bien, Buen Vivir, has been very much associated to support progressive government, left-wing movements, mass political movements, uh, fighting for social justice and, and, and so on. And this, I'm afraid, doesn't help the cause of Vivir Bien when those governments are replaced or fail uh, and we return to back, as, back to business as usual. And, and I'm afraid at that level, I think we're returning there right now. This, this connects very much with future. Um, you, when you look at Bolsonaro's Brazil, or, or, or you look at all sorts of countries uh, in Latin America right now, it's very difficult to see where the Virgin goes. Thank you, Kepa. That was great. I just really wanted to add a couple of points, if it's possible. If we have time, is it okay, Alex? We still have some time. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I have all the time in the world. It's whenever you guys want to go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, just one thing, I, I wanted to think about the limitations in terms of top-down approaches, in terms of uh, vivir bien or, uh, or development, and how the governments at time has these sort of top-down approaches, rather than looking at how people would like to, to live and, uh, and what would be important for them. So I think it, it is important also to say, I mean, I totally agree with uh, Kepa's uh, overview in terms of the tensions between growth-driven models of development uh, and sustainable natural resources exploitation. So this, I think, it's, it's very important. But I, I wanted actually to think about some of the successes, uh, for example, of the Morales government when it comes to Vivir Bien, uh, uh, because I think it will really help us to think about the challenges as well and the limitations. And uh, I wanted to think about, for example, Bolivia, uh, Bolivia Digna, which uh, implied uh, uh, social cash transfer programs uh, in Bolivia that were very helpful. And it was part of the new constitution, new national development plan, which was about uh, so the, the concept of Vivir Bien as well. So in a way, social cash transfer were very important to overcome extreme poverty uh, in the country. And we know that extreme poverty uh, has decreased. So that was something very important. But how do you put in place this sort of uh, redistributive uh, policies? It's very difficult, I think, for, uh, for governments, unless uh, you have the capital to do so. Sometimes I think uh, that even with the best ideals uh, in mind, you, you have to go through growth-driven models in order to provide the capital that then will be used in redistributive policies and, and welfare services as well. So the issue is very much at the global level because at the local level, I think it's not possible to put Vivirbian into place unless you have that capital that doesn't come easily. So. I, I totally agree with what Kepa was saying, but mm. I wanted also to, to emphasize uh, the importance of thinking about uh, power uh, and how it takes forms in different shapes uh, and how often governments, although with the best intentions and ideas, are not able to put into practice their policies. Well, they are able to put into practice some of their policies, uh, but they have to sacrifice some of the ideals 
because I think this is, is due to the capitalist system in, in, which we, uh, in which we live. And the other point I wanted to make was about uh, two uh, of the contributions in our special issue that uh, uh, Kepa talked about, which were by Carreño Calderón and Picaroni um, Sobrado and, and co-authors, which were talking about Chile. And Chile, we know, has put in place neoliberal policies. So in this case, uh, the concept of vivir bien is not appropriated by the government, is not included in their policies, although, I mean, it is in, they, they are trying to put it in place in order to provide uh, some sort of uh, better healthcare for the indigenous communities. However, we know that these top-down uh, approach uh, programs are very much proposing biomedical hegemony without taking into consideration indigenous communities' uh, system of knowledge in terms of health uh, and, and well-being. So sometimes they are also exploited by neoliberal governments in order to, let, let's say, in order to engage in a tick exercise. They say, oh, we are doing something for the vulnerable population, for the indigenous communities, but in reality, they are actually, they have a different agenda that they are promoting uh, through um, this program. Uh, and I think that, that Chile, if we look at other countries in Latin America, uh, it's a, a good example, especially when analyzing the healthcare system of neoliberalism at the highest level, um, where it's a fragmented uh, care system where people find it difficult to have uh, universal access to, to health care, which should be like uh, one of the main rights uh, of every individual, I think. Mm. Uh, and also this idea of putting into uh, place, for example, in Chile, uh, intercultural health projects didn't work uh, as much as it was expected because, uh, again, it was a top-down approach. And I think this is very mm. important to take into consideration. So on one level, it's top-down approaches that are an issue because they don't take into consideration the real perspective of people, of citizens. Uh, but on the other side, even when governments, like uh, the example of Bolivia, I think have good intention and ideals, it's very difficult then to implement policies that in a way seems to be a tension between themselves. So on one side, this mm -hmm. idea of uh, uh, redistributive policies or social cash transfers in order to help people to exit uh, extreme poverty. But on the other side, how do you create the capital that you need to do that? Thank you for bringing up that point, Melania. I've never had it framed to me in that way, but I think that's a really, really important way to look at it. These governments, as part of a global neoliberal economy, you're kind of dependent on that for the capital to implement these sorts of policies. But at, And at the same time, though, you want to implement policies that people want at the ground level, at the grassroots level, but how do you do that without a centralized, bureaucratic, neoliberal-esque state, at least in some manner? So yeah, there are these really important tensions that we need to look at and diagnose and dissect because uh, it's not so black and white. It's very complicated. Now, Kepa started to touch upon this, and and it was my it was my next question because we've seen this rise in in right wing populism throughout Latin America in the past five years or so, and I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts on on what this poses to Buen Vivir, how this has affected Buen Vivir in different contexts or locations? Yeah, I'm, I'm not in the business of crystal ball gazing. Uh, and I think you need a crystal ball <laughs> to know exactly where this is headed. Um, but, but clearly, I think the, the recent growth of uh, right-wing populist um, governments, the Trumpification of politics in Latin America, that's most evident perhaps with Bolsonaro in Brazil, can be a really, can be a good thing. I mean, for, for starters, this is a, a man who who sold his veins, uh, his own citizens, but he doesn't really want to bother putting together uh, any any kind of policies to to deal with a global pandemic that's killed almost half a million of his own citizens. I I, I think it'd be very difficult to see any positives for the cause of 
progressive politics, which inevitably I think Bibirbien is about in the current political climate in Latin America, I'm, I'm afraid. I, I'm not quite sure how, how else to elaborate on that, but it can, it just cannot be a, a positive thing. I mean, the only thing I can think of is the these kinds of politics, I mean, these kinds of, of, of uh, populist right wingers uh, governments in Latin America, like it elsewhere, I guess, like in, like in the United States, actually, with, with Trump, or there I say, with uh, Boris Johnson in our own country, are showing themselves not just for the complete disregard or lack of empathy for human well-being and so on. They're showing themselves to be deeply corrupt and deeply uh, really, really incompetent at, at the business of politics. <laughs> so, so the only hope, <laughs> the only hope is that is the hope that all progressive causes always have, which is that one day enough people will say enough and will significantly transform those political systems so that money doesn't always talk uh, to elect its own representatives at the top of the of the political system but i'm talking here more in in hope than in anything else i just don't see how what, what the political processes that lead to this new world might be. Uh, I, I was I was re-watching the, I think I mentioned it earlier, the clip that became very popular a few months ago uh, by Naomi Klein, Ocasio-Cortez, and so on about letters from the future. And and of course, they themselves always appeal. I think I, I have to say, I, I, I'm, I'm very much in tune with some of the arguments, some of the uh, objectives of, of and, and policy uh, suggestions and prescriptions from, from Naomi Klein. I just think she's unbelievably optimistic and, and, and I have often failed to share that degree of optimism but but they always the, all these progressive causes always resort to the same to the same view that some one day enough people will demand change meaningful change and will move these kinds of political leaders from the top of the policy making agenda but I mean that requires that most people also agree that their best interests are not served by these individuals. And I'm afraid to say where I'm standing in the UK, more and more people seem to uh, continue to want to vote for the same, for the same government, regardless of how badly it does uh, its job of governing and how corrupt it is being shown to be, and how incompetent. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what can I say? Yeah, I totally agree with that, Kepa. And for me, this move to right-wing governments is actually going to have an impact on uh, Vivirbien, for sure, for, for the majority uh, of, of people. And I'm here thinking about the privatization uh, of services and uh, how this will have uh, like further impact on health uh, and well-being. But I was actually, I, I totally agree with what Kepa was saying. I was thinking about uh, different right-wing governments uh, and the fact that uh, I think uh, that somehow there is a need for uh, collective well-being. Uh, there is a need for uh, thinking about uh, the others and not only ourselves. Uh, and, and I think the pandemic, unfortunately, is, is a good example of what has been happening at the global level. Uh, and I'm here thinking about the vaccines campaigns and the fact that the global south is left without vaccines. And while, you know, the global north has access and has implemented different campaigns. So this is just to say that I think right wing government think always that they are going to be saved no matter what. But it's really important to think uh, as a collectivity, to think uh, even in the case of a pandemic, if we don't provide vaccines to everyone in the world, more variants are going to come up. The vaccine might not be effective towards uh, those variants. So I think vivir bien or buen vivir is really important in this context because we need to think about uh, other peoples. It's not only us individuals being islands on our own. And it's all about this relational uh, well-being that is very important. So unless other people are saved, I don't think we can save ourselves. So I know that it, it may sound a little bit uh, a sort of cliche, 
uh, but I think it's important to, to think about vivir bien in this context. And I don't think that right-wing governments will uh, really go towards uh, the goal, the idea uh, of vivir bien or buen vivir. And I think that in the end, we will all be affected. The same, yeah. I mean, climate change as well. We need to think about uh, other countries as well, and not only the countries in which we live, but I think the governments sometimes are not open to this, and so this has consequences. Yeah, I was going to say, this is the politics of me first. Um, I'm not going to solve what are effectively global challenges. You cannot save yourself <laughs> in, the, in the face of climate breakdown, catastrophe. You cannot save but, yourself but, alone in the face of a global pandemic. You save exactly. all, well, or you or, don't or save also, Sorry, also the elite, the 1%, uh, thinking about uh, you know, missions to Mars, uh, to make uh, <laughs> like an escape uh, over there. It doesn't matter what is going to happen to the rest of the world. But I think they will need to think about the people that work for them because they cannot go up there on their own. So they will need to think about, uh, you know, people working for them, their families, they will need to provide for them because they cannot survive on their own. So, yeah. yeah. Indeed. <laughs> I, I completely agree with everything both of you just said. I think those are really incredibly important uh, points and, and great points to end on. But it points to something that we can take away from studying the Buen Vivir movements and your, reading your issue is the, the real need for a counter-hegemonic, counter-capitalist, counter-neoliberal worldview that is the dominant worldview, especially here in the United States where I live. I, I'm in the belly of the beast here in Southern California. Our culture is neoliberal capitalism here. But we need that sort of counter discourse, that counter ideology to foster relational, communal, anti-individualistic worldviews. And we need to move beyond that liberal idealism, uh, that liberal framing of history as this linear trajectory towards progress. Because as we found out, actually, no, things can get worse, a lot worse. And if we don't move beyond that and start start doing these things we're discussing, it could get even even worse for us. So uh, this was a wonderful conversation. Your issue is fantastic. I encourage all of our readers, if you don't get a physical copy, download a digital copy from either Sage or LatinAmericanPerspectives.com. And I look forward to maybe doing this again in the future if y'all edit another issue or contribute to Latin American Perspectives again. Thank you, Alex. That, that was great. I enjoyed the conversation very much. I hope um, it's useful to you and to Latin American Perspectives. Yeah, thank you so much, Alex. It was great. I also enjoyed the conversation. Hopefully, I hope our special issue can really contribute to the debate and helps thinking about uh, alternatives. Thank you so much, you guys. You have a great day, okay? Okay. Thank That's you so great. much, Alex. Thanks ever so That's much, great. Alex. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Bye, everyone. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today, but thank you so much for listening in. The May issue of Latin American Perspectives can be accessed at latinamericanperspectives.com or via Sage Publishing. Check the show notes for links to these websites where you can get access to the issue. If you enjoy the show and would like to receive updates about Latin American news, current events, and content from our journal, please don't forget to follow us on any of our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please be sure to listen in to our next episode. Thanks. Bye-bye.